really exciting to be here in Lisbon. This is the third day of the conference. It's the last stretch, that last hour. Uh, the sun is beaming down on us, encouraging us to find solutions, right? On the third day of the conference. First day, we, we get to know each other. Second day, we start talking about challenges. And third day, by the third day, we need to start talking about solutions, right? So my name is Louis de Marne. I'm with the uh, Decade Coordination Unit at IOC of UNESCO. I'm the Data and Information Management Officer. So replacing, uh, Jan Bart mentioned Terry McConnell. So uh, I took over from Terry. Uh, and I'm here for the, at least for the next two years, working with, uh, with Julian and Alison and the rest of the gang. Um, I've got two roles in the IOC, uh, in the Decade Coordination Unit. One is uh, as the administrator, or sometimes I like to call it the chief cat herder of the uh, data coordination group, the group of 25 experts that uh, Jan Bart and Kate Wing uh, co-chair. Uh, and uh, as Jan Bart mentioned, one of our goals is to come up with a strategic plan for data and information in the ocean decade. And this event is extremely useful to help us gather information that we will, we will be able to, to utilize in, in thinking through and, and organizing that strategic plan. So, so this is really important. The second role I have is of assembling a group of private sector companies to form the corporate data group. Uh, this was announced on Monday at the Decade Alliance uh, Forum, if you were there, by the, the CEO of Fugro. Uh, and this will, this, the idea there is to bring these companies together talk about some of the obstacles that might be there in terms of them sharing the data that, that they own that's often collected by Fuga and others, uh, and how do we find solutions to mitigate those, those, uh, those obstacles and be able to use that huge wealth of information and share it with the, the, the community. So those are the kind of two primary roles uh, I have at the IOC. Right, so that's enough about me. Let's, let me introduce the, the panel we have today. Uh, I'll start off with uh, Delmo Carvalho. Uh, who is the executive board member of the Portuguese Institute for the Sea and Atmosphere, IPMA. Uh, and he has worked on scientific policy and information management in marine sciences and technology to establish bridges between scientific knowledge and other sectors of society. Uh, and he's also worked, I understand, as an advisor to the government of Portugal on marine sciences issues and, and topics. So, Telmo, uh, welcome, welcome to this uh, side event. Uh, next to him, we have Pierre Bayorel who is the founder and director general of Mercator Ocean International, a non-trading organization owned by 10 public and research institutions in five different European countries, delivering operational ocean monitoring and fo forecasting services worldwide. And uh, Pierre will also be um, the uh, chair of the board of the newly formed Decade Collaborative Center for Ocean Prediction that, that we mentioned a little bit earlier, and we're really excited to have that along with the uh, Decade Coordination Offices for Ocean Observing and uh, Data Sharing that we have recently uh, been able to put together. So thank you, Pierre, for being here. Uh, next to Pierre, we have Harvey Kremer, who is the Senior Program Officer and Head of Global Environmental Monitoring Unit at uh, the United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP. Uh, and, and he coordinates those activities, the global environment monitoring systems in the data partnerships with focus on freshwater the ocean and air quality. So thank you for being here as well. Now, you might rightly think that in terms of diversity, we're doing rather poorly here on the stage. Uh, and uh, you'd be absolutely right. We do have two other panelists who we were hoping to be able to bring in live. Uh, unfortunately, we're not been able to do that. So they have sent us some pre-recorded videos. But I will introduce them, of course. We've got Arlene Lang who is the coordinating director of the Caribbean Meteorological Organization, CMO, uh, the headquarters in Trinidad and Tobago. And she is the permanent representative of the British Caribbean territories with the WMO. We also have uh, a message that we'll show shortly with, uh, from Lucy Scott, who is the project manager at IOC UNESCO for the in Ocean Info Hub project. And she will talk about that in her message. Uh, she is also a marine scientist with over 20 years of experience in 12 countries, mainly in the African region, on large marine ecosystems, GIS atlas data, and information projects. So that's the panel for today. Um, so the topic of this roundtable is building on what we just heard, which was what some we heard some, some success stories, some examples of regional, uh, local interoperability in the private sector as well. Now, how do we bring that up a notch? How do we scale up? 
uh, this, this data interoperability. So the, the title is Scaling Up Marine Data and Information Interoperability for the Ocean Decade and the Implementation of SDG 14. What are some of the, what's the future look and the recommendations? So um, I'd like to start off maybe with, with you, Telmo, uh, and, <laughs> and maybe with a slightly philosophical question, right? Which is, uh, we talked about data sharing, we talked about data access and interoperability. What, uh, in, in your view, what is the, the incentive? What is the, what's, the, what's in it for countries and organizations for them to share their data, right? What, what benefit do they get out of it? Why should they uh, do this? Yeah, that's, that's a, it's not a philosophical question, it's a practical one, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Because, uh, well, um, I'm not a data expert, so I'm, I'm a science manager, basically. Okay. And uh, what I have to, to, one side, I have to convince my scientists that we need to share data, and I need also to convince them that they need to share their data. So, and that's a problem that we, uh, the science managers uh, face every day. So, basically, uh, we have to, to, to have the approach of a user and of a provider. And that's the, the, the dialogue that you have to do on a daily basis. Right. So basically, for us, uh, uh, um, and the, 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 what the, the scientists ask me is to have access to uh, different data, to compare with their data and, provide, uh, and, and study long series and so on and so on. And I have to provide them tools to do that. Right. That's what we try to do as science managers. So mm -hmm. uh, if they see that they have a, a, a return for their work also, they will provide their data, right. okay? Right. And sometimes it's even difficult to, 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 to work inside of our organization much more at a European or international level. So that is the, the, the balance that we have to do. Of course, when we convince them with uh, standardized uh, um, data to compare with others that will benefit their, their research work, their publication and so on, that helps to have all the, the, the community uh, doing their part right okay yeah. so for us the, in, in terms of vipma it's quite obvious that we have a, a, an open access uh, policy at in at national uh, level all our data is available and we allow everybody to download the data that we gather in our um, uh, daily monitoring um, not daily by vessel, but daily uh, on the coast shore and so on. So for us, it's an open access uh, policy for the, the not only for the research community, but also for the private sector, for all sectors of society. Uh, it's not freely available, it's freely accessible, mm -hmm. uh, and just, just, they just need to, to tell us what kind of data they need, and we give them a code to download in the website at national level. Right. Internationally, we, we, we fully uh, support the, the European, uh, in our case, Emonet is our, it, it's the place that we right. use as a provider and also as a, as a, um, where we store our information so it can be shared uh, at international level. So basically, the, our role as science managers is to convince the scientific community of the utility of yeah. sharing data uh, and, and using common standards in order that science uh, evolves faster. Right. That's my philosophical answer. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Telmo. And of course, that's that's. I, I mean, I come from the private sector. I'm the Fugro uh, in kind support to the to the Ocean Decade. So I know all about you know explaining that storytelling and saying this is this is the what's in it for for, for you, right? Yeah. And I think you you explain it quite well, which is if you, you know, sharing your data, you will be have access to other data sets that that you would not have otherwise. So sometimes it's a problem between. Um, when you work with academics, sometimes it's a problem of having the, 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 the data as fast released as they need to produce scientific papers. It's as simple as that. Yeah. It's a practical issue. It's not philosophical. It's a practical issue. It's a career issue. <laughs> so, so, and that's what you have to, to try to overcome, showing the benefits of it. Right, right. Okay, super. Thanks very much, Tamil. So, so with that, uh, let's, let's move on now to look at really the topic about sc scaling up. And I think as we see a growing number of ocean data and information providers out there, uh, you know, that, that, that presents certain challenges, right, in, in, in that scaling up. Uh, and, and there's several that, that I'd like to, to touch on, and I'm going to ask uh, Pierre and, and Hartwig to, to address those two. There's, there's the issue of, of quality control, of course. There's the issue of how do end users decide what is fit for purpose as well. And then last but not least is 
how do you then match the need with the availability? Okay, so those are kind of three three challenges that I see. So, so Pierre, if you want to start off and, and tell us what you think about those challenges and how we can deal with them. Yes, thank you, uh, Louis. Uh, so don't ask me to put complicating um, <laughs> concepts on this because I really believe that I hope that we will multiply the number of data that can be uh, proposed to, uh, to us in the, in the coming years. But I really believe that uh, the key word is the maintain or develop the trust mm -hmm. and, be, be, and, and manage this. I mean, uh, we must uh, really be driven by the fact that uh, the users or ourselves, we should trust the system to, to deliver something that is uh, relevant. And so maybe it could be about the quantity because you want to trust the system to deliver something that well, you're looking for. It could be the accuracy as well, that uh, this is something that will be reliable for you. And also, and I sh we should not neglect this part, is the fact that uh, it should be sustained. So that you're not trying to use this one, that uh, a project or something else that will disappear after that. So I really think that um, manage the, 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 the trust that we, you could have in the system. If you have a lot of data, if you, I think this is this is very important. Now coming to um, to this uh, this uh, accuracy, uh, yes, of course, uh, we should develop uh, something that is clear about the the the, um, uh, the trust you could have on the quality of the data. What we do so. Um, what I've done myself during the, the past year was to, uh, to set up this Copernicus service in, in Europe where we are processing data, in situ observations, but also satellite data, and then we are running models. And uh, we, um, we try something which I believe is, is interesting, is that every time we, we propose the data, there is a quid, quality ID card, mm. which explains uh, what we know about this data, the accuracy, what the, the, the level of trust we have ourselves as a, as, a, as a producer and what we observe when we compare with, uh, with other things. And so this, this query is, is, is one way of um, developing this, uh, this trust on, on, on the data. There are many other things that we could imagine. It has to be verified by experts. It, got to, it could be certified, there is something. But of course, if we have a lot of data that are uh, available, and I hope it will, it will be the case, and mm -hmm. I'm sure it will be the case, then we, we must identify the level of um, of, um, of trust that we could have, and we also must recognize that in some cases this is not possible. That you have some data that are immediately shared without having time to uh, verify or to uh, to and others that are that that went through the all the validation chain with all the QC control, and this one is uh, level three, and this one is level one. I don't know mm -hmm. this kind of stuff. And then about the um, the the relevance for the users. Um, we must invite the users from the very first day in this, this bus. Yeah. Recognize as well that uh, the users are more frequently the providers. As, I mean, the, the distinction we have between the producers and the users uh, is already a bit difficult some, sometimes because we, we know that we, we are, this is the same community many, many, in many occasions and that with an idea where we will have super system where the, you enter into that and you generate yourself the data you need, the users and the providers are where will be. But still, the user's point of view should be invited at the very first stage in this, and the way you will organize this uh, super data portfolio mm -hmm. should be driven by the user's portfolio, mm -hmm. by the user's point of view, mm -hmm. and not by what we usually do by the origin of the data. You go uh, from one satellite and you, you have this data set or you have this, this regional uh, network for institute and you have this data set. And the, the users, they have to navigate into all this to find a way. So I think that we, we really need to, to have this. And the last point is um, to equip our system with this operational monitoring of the, the user's behavior. <laughs> This is what we have in this in this Copernicus system, and it's 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 interesting to see uh, how much data uh, are downloaded of this part, or how much data are accessed, or this one are completely neglected, and how we can change in time. Um, how when we adapt the uh, the, the way we, we we propose the portfolio, the, the behavior of the users is uh, is uh, responding to to that. So uh, we have a lot of of uh, tools that are professional monitoring tools to. Uh, to monitor the transaction, 
And uh, I believe this should be uh, something we, 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 we should have in our systems for the future, just to, be, to have this dashboard and say, okay, there is something happening there. Yeah. And then invite the users to understand what is happening. Yeah. Well, that's okay. all for me. Thanks. Okay. Okay, thank you. And actually, that brings to mind an idea, which is, uh, you know, you, what well, you said, let's build trust. And the way to, to, to build trust is make sure that the quality is good. And we, we, there are some technical ways we can do that. But I know you're quite close to, to, to all the discussions around digital twins of the ocean. And, and I see that digital twins also as an opportunity to, as a bit of a quality control tool in a sense, because if you have this digital representation, you, you're navigating through it, you can quite quickly see, hang on, there's different, there's holes here, there's, there's different types of data quality resolution, etc. So I think that might be also potentially a tool that we could use uh, for, for, for looking at data quality issues. Yeah. They most probably, yes, the, the users will be the referee. I mean, they, yep. if this is not used, it will be immediately uh, yep. seen. But the more you connect the different uh, things, the more you, you, you develop this digital ecosystem, etc., the more you have to be able to certify the quality of what you deliver. Yep. And yep. today we are really very close to science, to uh, the knowledge, and we should not forget this. We should not go in the super space of digital things without having this, uh, this, this clear uh, link with the, uh, with the science, I mean the, 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 the quality check and the fact that we can certify that what we propose is, is uh, verified. Okay, thank you, thank you, Pierre. So, Hartwig, uh, wondering if I could come to you then for, for maybe some comments on, on, on this particular question as well, of how do we match the need with the availability and, and so on. Yeah, let me start. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Uh, uh, let me start with a quick response to the first question yeah. actually you, you posed, and that was what convinces countries to share data. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as soon as the countries are with you in front of a big screen, like we have that every now and then in, in the World Environment Situation Room in the United Nations Environment Assembly, they don't want to be the white spot on the map. <laughs> It's pure psychology. It's simply, oh, I, I want to be there. I want to make sure yep. the data is available. The same comes to the to the to the uh, to the works. fact that it works. <laughs> when we use in global environment monitoring system Ocean, thanks to our great collaboration with Mercator Ocean International, also the 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 my Ocean tool, you you be confronted with the government from the Seychelles or the Maldives, and they say, okay, what does the sea look like in my exclusive economic zone? Mm. So, okay, back to what UNEP's role is. UNEP is in, in a very tricky position we, because, first of all, we are not per se, qua mandate, a, a, a physical or a scientific data expert. We are a high-level data user. Mm -hmm. And we are a broker because at the other end of the value chain is 193 member states. And um, they have their specific demands and requests. Some of them are coming together under multilateral environmental agreements, such as the regional seas conventions, for instance, and they are a stamp collection. Some of them are well set, extremely highly developed, and those uh, which are under administration of UNEP, for instance, are quite heterogeneous and very, very different stages of development, producing, utilizing data, or even in the position to articulate which data is relevant for them. Mm. So in recent conversations, with the United Nations Environment Assembly, but also with our executive director and the chief scientist. I mean, the question came up, what's the future of UNEP's mandate in order to inform the three planetary crises, which is climate change, biodiversity, and pollution? And that's basically to work in partnership with the data providers and ensure that we have access to quality assured and quality controlled globally available data. But when it comes to, let's say, making those data relevant for country uptake or for specific transformational contexts, such as this morning discussed with the private sector, the rapid transformation of continental shelves towards pushing in the direction of renewable energy, which is topical, very, very topical, then we need to actually have a partnership process with the end users, with the data providers, with us as a normative organization to make sure we provide a scientifically sound and user-friendly cookie cutter that allows to bring those data to their attention that are relevant. Mm -hmm. However, let me just go one level more deep. That's the kind of ocean view. If you go into the freshwater context, it's a bit different. 
because in freshwater, UNEP is probably one of the leading agencies that really addresses freshwater quality. Mm -hmm. So there we ourselves rely on countries sharing with us their freshwater quality monitoring data. That works again very fine as long as you are standing next to the minister. As soon as the person is back home, I tell you it's becoming all way too strategic to be shared. <laughs> and then comes the data management question. The data management question is one that has also quite institutional dimensions in the countries and re we receive that particularly as a capacity development request. So when it comes to the upstream definition of essential variables, the criteria, the metadata, that's work we would draw on from the community This is, a, this is in this audience. But when it comes to, let's say, validating in the utility of making transformations and making change against specific topics in the countries, we also need to ask them, is this data relevant for you? And if not, what is the additional demand that you have? What is the additional request of data or what can you bring? And that takes me to a last point, uh, for the moment at least, um, citizen science. Because UNEP also plays a role as a custodian, a custodian for several uh, sustainable development goals, monitoring and reporting processes. <laughs> now you ask me what's the quality control and the quality assurance that we have in these data provisions and sharing. Shaky mm -hmm. is the answer, very shaky. Why? Because if you look for instance as it, it, into this water quality indicator, which is a composite indicator drawing on just five very simple chemical parameters and physical. Then these data come to you as an aggregated value. Mm -hmm. What you usually don't know, you can take them by the hand and guide them through the process and that's what we do, but you still don't know how they finally arrived at this aggregated value. But what you do know is that if you go down, let's say, the scale of national GDP, the lower that goes, the lower is the number of systems, catchment systems, lakes, transboundary right. systems or groundwater systems, this data comes from. So the reliability of the SDG reporting is already a big, big ticket for us to tackle. So what is the answer to that? Complement with citizen science and that's where flagging comes into place or actually level one or level two quality assurance. But our chief scientists, for instance, and we with our clients are quite clear, we say, okay, we use quality assured data as much as we can access those. Mm -hmm. We take everything else as well. We want to make sure it's just properly communicated with the disclaimers, with the note of caution, but you could otherwise actually dump the whole SDG process if you wouldn't work like that. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Oh, super, really good uh, insights there, Hartwig. Thanks for that. And uh, so now we've, we've looked at that question of, of quality and, mm -hmm. and matching needs with, with mm -hmm. um, with availability. Uh, like to move on to another question, and that's where here um, our link is, is also going to come in and, and help us out. Is the idea that you know we we probably can't do everything, right? So how do we prioritize, particularly within the ocean decade, how do we prioritize uh, which types of data and information we need to address the, the ocean decade challenges? So if we could add the, the first video for Arlene, where she uh, tries to answer that question. Hello everyone, thank you for inviting me to participate oh, in the UN Ocean Conference. I'm Arlene Lang, Coordinating Director for the Caribbean Meteorological Organization, headquarters in Trinidad and Tobago. The CMO promotes and coordinates regional activities in weather, climate and water related sciences in 16 English speaking member states. We work closely with the World Meteorological Organization on marine meteorology service delivery and with regional partners on regional early warning systems and disaster risk reduction for oceanic hazards. I've been asked to weigh in on the question of how do we prioritize the types of data and information we need to address the ocean decade challenges. Well, I would suggest that we prioritize in terms of urgency, timeliness, and the impact of the data and information injection. Primary priority is, of course, protecting lives and property, ensuring community resilience to multiple oceanic hazards, 
which requires real-time data exchange and dynamic ocean model solutions for things like marine transport and trade. Other interventions for data exchange are on longer time scales, such as the El Niño Southern Oscillation, which is on interannual time scales, or the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, which is related to major societal impacts, including floods, droughts, and tropical cyclone activity. I would also suggest that research is needed to determine the basic global observation system and modeling systems that are needed for a well-predicted ocean on the global scale. Subsequently, a supporting policy would need to be developed for data to support a safe and well-predicted ocean. The World Meteorological Organization serves as a model because it has a global basic observation network that was developed to support numerical weather prediction, earth system modeling, and climate analysis, which are all for the public good of all nations. The WMO's Unified Data Policy supports the free and unrestricted exchange of core data as mandatory, and other data are recommended for sharing. All are part of a value cycle to support effective decision-making, which is also seen as a necessary impact within CARICOM or the Caribbean community. What is extremely important for small island developing states is to have more marine observations because most of us has much larger oceanic areas compared to our land areas, and we need the products and services, especially for better monitoring of tropical cyclones and to support our lucrative tourism, trade, and other economic activity. The other challenge, of course, is reducing of marine pollution, which sometimes requires real-time data for rapid pollution discharge, or longer-term data to support long-term solutions to marine pollution. Other challenges, biodiversity, economic restora eco ecosystems restoration, rather, and sustainable food security solutions have additional data needs at different time and spatial scales. All right. So that was that was Arlene, and we'll get back to Arlene later on as well because she she answered uh, some other points as well. But really interesting here there to hear from uh, her perspective from the point of view of small island developing nations, but also uh, the the WMO model, uh, and also then she was talking about you know the essentially addressing some of those key challenges that we have within the ocean decade and saying these are the types of priority data sets we would need to to address those those challenges, which are very real, and you could hear you know, how they how these directly impact the, the coastal communities. So another question that we have in terms of scaling up is, um, you know, what, what are some of the recommendations in terms of maybe things that we need to be careful of, uh, potential, uh, potential um, how shall I say, traps not to fall into, uh, you know, in, in terms of m working towards that openly accessible interoperable data for all. And, and looking at perhaps at the whole value chain, not just data, making data accessible, but the whole value chain. So, so here I'd like to maybe ask you, Pierre, if uh, you could comment on that. How, you know, what are some of the re recommendations then as we scale up for, towards this <laughs> openly accessible, interoperable data? Yes, well, I, I like this one because we uh, we addressed this this question some years ago with our users, and I just want to repeat what they said because I'm afraid it will be exactly the same for the coming decade. Mm. So the question was, uh, well, the, the intention is to have something which is an open um, uh, open access to the data, really accessible. What do you, what, how do you think we should implement this? And the user said, well, first, uh, be very clear and, and be very simple. If this is open, this is open. Mm. Don't start by uh, with b building something with a footnote that, uh, well, this is open, but in the condition is this and this and this. Right. If this is not really open, it's maybe that you, you're not ready for this. It's because there, there are, you could have a very good reasons. It's confidential or okay, but please focus on the part that is fully open and fully accessible. So this is what, what we, so this, this, this one is, is, uh, I mean, constantly you can come back to this, to this, to this point, because of course you can complicate it because you want to invite more but then you will have different things to so keep it very simple then uh, i was surprised by the fact that i was expecting something about the technical barriers but the first thing was uh, 
the, the first, so you have to go to, to all the barriers preventing us to access the data. If you want to be open and accessible, you have to remove all the barriers or at least reduce the barriers. And the first one is that I'm not aware of the existence of the data. Mm. I'm not aware. Mm. So before starting talking about the, the, the technical part, be sure that you, 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 you are, I mean, organized to explain that this data is somewhere. Because usually you are, you are, you are, you're trying to, uh, to um, solve your problem without being aware that the data you need is somewhere. And then when you know that there is this data somewhere, the second thing is where should I go? Mm -hmm. You could have multiple, multiple uh, things, you don't know where to go. So here, of course, we have uh, simplified things. You have now um, systems to centralize the access or at least to navigate and then you can access everything and it will be more and more the case in the coming futures. But the first concern was I'm not aware of the existence and then I don't, where, I don't know where to go to find it. And when this is, this is done, and I repeat, I mean, I think this is a constant uh, fight to maintain this uh, in the coming decade, it would be the case. Then you can go for the different uh, barriers. Uh, well, just for the, the, the something that was um, there some years ago, it was the cost. You have maybe you, even if you pay one dollar, I mean it's enough to stop you. And so, if this is open, it's better to be free. But okay. <laughs> and then you have the technical, the formats, the, uh, the the way it is presented, the size of the the thing you have, the the file that you have to to play with, then the month width and, and etc. And and this, of course, in the in the coming decade things will be completely different from what we experienced in the in the, in the last in, in the past years I mean it's more about the tools than than the data but uh, we have to go one by one and, and, and take all the barriers and at the end of the day uh, the, 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 the I think maybe the most important is that okay this is open but it has to be accessible and usually the reason why you're not play, you're not using this data is because you don't understand mm. you don't so being Providing something which is accessible means providing all the information that is necessary for the users to understand what what's in the box <coughs> and what's the use of it and what uh, how to use that. Connect with the experts, uh, connect with other, um, and have some share the best practices, etc. And this part is very very important and it makes the difference. Mm -hmm. It really makes the difference. Of course, the technical part is is, is fundamental. You have to uh, simplify the life. And I have multiple examples of um, of, of experience when we, we we unlock something and then we we we, we saw the uh, the um, the curve of the uptake that is grow okay. But really, I really believe that the, the thing is that we we must um, think about accessibility as the explanation of what is this information that is available. Mm. And so it's not uh, it's not a concept. It's, it's really well you know, this this is. This is what you have here. These are the experts you can talk about uh, the, the, the data. If you want to that, you have some examples of the uh, how it is used by, by the others, etc. Yeah. And so uh, this is just to open this idea of open and accessible. This, of course, there is a the technical part, but there is all the rest. I mean, the co to communicate, to, to say that it does exist, to simplify the access, of course, and to explain the content and to support, to provide a service, to provide a service to support the users in the in the way they, they intend to play with this. Yeah, yeah. so really understanding the, what insights they can get out of the data. Mm -hmm. And that also goes back to the question we were just talking about before, which is let's understand what uh, questions the, the end users are asking themselves, and then also work our way back as to say, right, well, these are the types of insights, and therefore these types of data that we, that we need as well. Okay, I'm, I'm seeing that I need to, uh, to accelerate. So what I will do is, um, I might skip one video, guys, at the back. So, uh, I, but I will show. Uh, sorry, <laughs> just the screen, blue screen of death just appeared for a second there. Um, so, what we're going to hear uh, from who we're going to hear from next is is from uh, from Lucy, if we are a bit uh, short for time, um, who talks about the the Ocean Info Hub project and ODIS as a solution offering in data interoperability. Uh, but she also addresses a really important point uh, that we uh, that we also. Uh, kind of struggled with a little bit in the data coordination group is how do we account for local and indigenous knowledge? So if we could have video three, please, um, we'll we'll hear um, Lucy talk about that. Coming right up. 
There we go. Good evening, and thank you very much for the opportunity to join this side event on marine data interoperability. My name is Lucy Scott, Project Manager of the IOC Ocean InfoHub project. This project aims to facilitate improved access to the wealth of existing online global oceans information data and knowledge products for management and sustainable development. The project links and anchors a growing network of regional and thematic nodes that will improve online access to and synthesis of existing global, regional and national data information and knowledge. These resources include existing clearinghouse mechanisms and online resources of open access information. The project is not establishing a new database, but will be supporting discovery and interoperability of existing information systems through the development of a lightweight ocean data and information system architecture. This enables end users to discover data in, and information products and services. We're working with over 30 uh, partner organizations to demonstrate proof of concept of the ODIS architecture, and 12 of these are now indexed in the knowledge graph, which allows them to be discovered through the ODIS network. Partners include Equidox, Ocean Best Practices, Marine Training.eu, the Marine Institute Data Catalog, Ocean Expert, the Ocean Biodiversity Information System, the Marine Spatial Atlas for the Western Indian Ocean, Sea Data Net, in remark from Colombia, Blue Ocean, Remotenet, and others. We have a global hub search, search function as proof of concept, and we are currently in the design phase of a front end user interface building an OS architecture. Uh, the front end will incorporate matchmaking services like identification of study and training opportunities, identification of specialists in certain fields or regions vessel survey opportunities and services supporting peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. The ODIS architecture is open. Our documentation is published online and open for contributions. Anyone can access the knowledge graph and develop their own portals of interest for their own stakeholder communities. With regard to local and indigenous knowledge, it's important to value indigenous worldviews and in respect to historical and social contexts. The care principles for indigenous data governance are really useful principles to keep in mind here. These are those of collective benefit, authority to control the use of information, responsible use of information and ethics. These are not necessarily in conflict with open access and fair principles, but do require a slightly different approach to data sharing. For example, a greater emphasis on the sharing of metadata and data about the holders of indigenous knowledge rather than the actual data themselves. This gives more control to curators of indigenous knowledge rather than blanket open access. Thank you. All right, thank you very much to Lucy. So um, interesting point there, kind of what Ben was talking about a little bit as well, is share the metadata, not the necessarily the data itself, uh, but at least you know that data is, exists and is accessible. Right, so uh, I'll move on to the last question, uh, and this is for, for all three of you on the, on the panel. Uh, the question of what, in your view, should be that, that uh, end goal, that end product, or the legacy, let's say, of, uh, of the ocean decade in terms of, of data and information. So, uh, Telmo, if I, could, if I could go to you first. You can. <laughs> uh, well, I have a dream. Excellent. Let's hear it. But I will start from the realistic point of view first. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, being realistic, if we go a step further in, in the issue of the standardization um, and in the issue of the interoperability, I think it's already a, a, a positive uh, part of, of, of this period and this uh, enforcement that we are doing the, during this decade. Uh, and I think that will be already positive because we have to be aware that we are thinking about uh, and talking and discussing about data and dating interoperability and uh, as the experts know at uh, very different levels around the world so if we go one step further on that direction and if we can create um, a common standard that everybody will apply and that everybody has the capacity to apply i think it's already a, a major achievement mm -hmm. but i have a dream and, and my dream is basically to have 
have a digital ocean mm -hmm. that easily, uh, because at the end, why do we need the data? We need the data because we need fast answers to, to uh, faster problems occurring every day. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, a population that, we, that needs to have immediate warnings on dangers. Um, and we have politicians that are bothering us every day, give, give us answers to solutions so we can make decisions. So I need a digital ocean that can put it all the IA that you need, but that gives me an answer very fast in order that in 15 minutes I can advise rapidly a guy saying, please close that area for fishing or else it will disappear. Please, that ecosystem will die in a minute. So that's what I need. And that is my dream for, for the end of this decade. Yeah. No, <laughs> so, so imagine that, right? That what's happening out there in, in the ocean. I have it almost in real time yeah. on my laptop here and I can make decisions. I love that dream. All right. Thank you very much, <laughs> Telmo. Pierre, over to you. <laughs> OK, same, same step. So first the commitment and then the objective. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so commitment, I will be very humble, but I, I want in, this, in, in the coming decade to do in Europe, I will talk about Europe, this complete um, connection between Emonnet and Copernicus. Mm -hmm. For some reason, we have these two great services that have been developed in, in parallel. And with Jan Bart and, uh, and his team, we are taking really hard and we are working to merge this because this is the same the same thing. I mean, we have Copernicus with in-situ satellite prediction. We have Emonnet with different categories of in -situs, And we have really this, it must be done. So we are working already on that. But be humble, I mean, we need some time, but we must have this super uh, data uh, ecosystem. I don't know how you call that, uh, Ian Bart in the introduction, but uh, okay, let's do that first. And then the dream or the, maybe the, uh, the objective, uh, we will implement this Decade Collaborative Center for Ocean Prediction. We will implement this one for about coastal resilience. So we will go to connect all this community worldwide with ocean prediction, coastal centers everywhere. And the first thing we do when we meet a colleague somewhere, we share the data. This is the way we, we behave. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we need an ocean data information system that is our system where we will be able, when we have some data sets that are ready to share, to easily uh, share the data so that it can be accessible for the others. And it has to, and we are ready for this. We are ready as oceanographers, as a community. And we, this is obvious to me that at the end of the decade, this ocean community that we represent here must have its own uh, information system, this ocean data, um, I don't know how you would call that, but this is clear to me that this is what we should achieve. Okay. Yeah, digital ecosystem. Thank you very much, Pierre. So Hartwig, you have the tough task of uh, having the final say and the, the insp inspirational vision and words there. Go ahead. No, oh, that's a good one. Is it a dream or, an, or, or a nightmare? So let's let's <laughs> let's let's think about it. So the, the dream would be that the decade is a vehicle to help us really generate an atmosphere of trust mm -hmm. and and behavioral change that can really open up the door for, for data information, dissemination and sharing. That's not there yet and certainly we, we rely on that. That goes to the, to the extreme, this mic is moving, yep. it goes to the extreme that, that even ministerial level representatives start arguing whether we should use satellite data in providing global environmental outlook functions, which is our mandate. So it can get that kind of weird detailed and weird yeah, okay. yeah on the other hand what I would like to do is to work with this community to enable UNEP to have a proper filter function that helps us really distill out of the available ocean data the essential variables those which are really making cases for transformation against climate change climate adaptation that's a very tricky one because these uh, variables are not yet fully defined not also not in the climate context um, on pollution, and we all talk about plastics, marine litter, we talk about nitrogen, we talk about emerging pollutants and so on, and that we have the functionality in this filter partnership process to provide true, I would say, foresight on emerging issues. So now comes the nightmare part, because there is a, there, there is a lot of jargon around and argumentation about these unbelievable and unlimited power of digital transformation. Mm -hmm. And and I, I would just like to, to put a note of caution. 
because that has two dimensions. One is in-house, get your job done, and that is a, a long pathway for us. And the other one is what it really means in terms of bringing things interoperable together. We have done a lot of work on finding the semantic ontologies for freshwater, and we didn't get there in the end, at least not fully. So that's process, it's ongoing. It's a long, long process to go. UNEP is not a technical agency, but that's where I would see we want to, we want to bring us towards, same with oceans. The other thing was mentioned several times. I think uh, Pierluigi brought it up in the end. It's as much a people problem as it is a technical mm -hmm. problem. We have heard about open access and so on and so forth. What that comes down to is data policy. And do we have a data policy? We have a mandate on the table from the United Nations Environment Assembly by 2025, provide an environmental data strategy for UNEP. Mm -hmm. There's no talk whatsoever of a policy. There is a good data policy out there, and it was mentioned, uh, the WMO has one. Mm -hmm. Does the UN have some? I don't, I'm not aware of. So, and, and that is where I really think a major bottleneck, which can partially trim down any potential outcome of whatever decade we are talking about, whether that's the ocean science, ecosystem restoration, water action, doesn't matter. And now my final and ultimate dream, let's the water action decade and the ocean science decade allow us to close the loop of data across the hydrological cycle. Okay, excellent. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Hartwig, for, for those comments. So I think uh, we don't really have time for questions. I'm looking at Jan Bart and, and Kate. Nope. Okay. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so thank you very much to, to the panel. Let's give them a big round of applause, please. And the ocean, the ocean decade is an opportunity to transform the way we do things. So let's, uh, we have work to do on our strategic plan, but the information has been really, really good. So I'd like to invite Kate Wing over to help us close out the side event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louis, and thank you to all of you for staying through this conversation, a roller coaster of deep dive technical and aspirational dreams for our future ocean that I believe with the people in this room and the people who will be watching this later, we can achieve. It's my pleasure to introduce our closing remarks speakers, starting with Julian Barbieri, the head of marine policy and regional coordination at the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission at UNESCO. And I'm just going to invite him to speak uh, just right here from this microphone and give us a few remarks. What have you heard today and what do you want to bring to this conversation going forward? Thank you very much, Kate, and, and thank you to all the speakers today. I mean, I think this was very, very informative. I want to be brief because I'm probably the last thing between, uh, between now and a nice glass of uh, vino verde on a, or a nice dinner. But I think, you know, You've heard a lot about the decade and, and what we are trying to do in the context of a decade when it comes to data. And data and information is really a, a, a cornerstone of a success of, of the ocean decade. We have created that space, which is called the Data Coordination Group, for discussion, interaction between different uh, you know, providers of data. Uh, and, and really, this idea of developing a strategic plan is, is very important. Uh, and I would like maybe to take the challenge that Harvey also mentioned, because it is true that we need to also address the data policy issues, which provides a, a, a major constraint to uh, you know, some of the data exchange and, and, and collaboration, including an, amongst nations. And, and if we do not address this elephant in the room, uh, we might you know, not get what we want to achieve through, through the decade. So I think uh, it is indeed about creating these global ocean data ecosystems. It is also about providing a space to understand what users really need in terms of data to inform their uh, collective management of the, uh, you know, and stewardship of the ocean environment. What variables do we need for climate change adaptation, for marine spatial planning? What type of resolution do we need? And I think the decade through this, uh, you know, co-design uh, principle and philosophy can, can try to create that, that dialogue and, and help us to better target and deliver the data and the information that, that, that we need. So a lot of things we've heard today will be very useful uh, to the group. And next week, they will start getting at work, getting the pen and the paper and spend a few days in Paris uh, to start putting together the, you know, the main elements. I think we are also seeing uh, in the context of a decade, the infrastructure which we are starting to build. Uh, you know, we have a a decade coordination unit, we have a decade advisory board, we have now decade collaborative centers, 
that are actually coordinate, coordinating efforts across the whole data and information value chain, from acquisition all the way to the end users, including observations, data management, sharing, modeling, and prediction. So these newly formed entities will need to work together to exploit the synergies, uh, to avoid duplication of effort, and to transform the whole ocean data and information ecosystems. And of course, there are focal points for the decade uh, in terms of data and information, so please reach out to them uh, for you also to, to engage. And then finally, um, and I think uh, uh, Luis mentioned that uh, at the beginning of the session, that we are also establishing a corporate data group to unlock the privately held ocean data sets and hopefully also unlock other kinds of uh, support from the private sector because we need all hands on deck uh, so for the decade to succeed. So my call is really out to the private sector. Companies are there to please engage with the decade and the ocean science community. So let's join forces to make this ocean decade a real success. And please reach out to Luis because that's his main task in the coming two years to really try to open up uh, this access and, and find really a, a truly, uh, a, you know, meaningful collaborating, collaborating mode with the private sector uh, to, to, to deliver this, uh, this, this, uh, this ambition. So with this, thank you very much and uh, see you all, all very soon. Thank you. We also have some remarks from Anne-Catherine Lescroth of the Flanders Marine Institute. And my apologies if my American tongue has butchered your last name, but I didn't practice enough with Jan Barth, so it's, it's our shared co-chair fault next time. Hello, just checking if this works well. Okay. Well, these are big shoes and about everything has been said, so it's not really a grateful moment to say something, but I will try to be, um, to be brief, of course, and to bring in some new elements, um, that have not been said. These are very few, actually. Um, I expected to hear a lot of technical elements today, and I was really struck and surprised that a lot of the elements I heard today were, in fact, non-technical. They're human. And, um, we spoke about interoperability. And uh, as far as I understand, I am a marine scientist. I work in a Flanders Marine Institute that is, um, part of this uh, consortium, of course. And, um, the elements of interoperability are, uh, it's layered, right? So we have uh, the technical and the governance elements. And we spoke a lot about that today. And I think maybe if I can say so, you'll probably not be, not be agreeing with me, but maybe these are the most simple to address because they're in our hands. But I also heard a lot about um, legal instruments and about administrative arrangements. And I heard Telmo speak a lot about, um, speci specifically in um, our public funding instruments, we can do a lot. We are doing a lot. Um, it, we all know that, for instance, in our Horizon Europe, uh, it is now a requirement to have a data management plan. But I really wonder who is looking at these data man management plans, because you really need to be an expert to look well and see through and not have just as a you know checking the box and another thing I wonder from a perspective of a practical um, of being in this project management is um, we have data management plans as a requirement but what happens with the data I'm personally struck to see that there are no requirements to ensure that we we invest in infrastructure such as emotnet and others but there is no um, hard requirement to ensure that the data flows towards these infrastructures, whereas they're from the same family. So I, I wonder whether we can step up our ambitions there also. And then um, about, um, about um, y yes, about the human aspect, um, you know, even if we step up our ambitions there, uh, in this publicly funding instrument, this large element, large um universe as the other person spoke about is there's a lot of data there that depends on finally on our voluntary engagements voluntary commitments and this is where the um, the human behavior element comes in to see how we can and i'm personally as, um, also involved in this because i'm i also um, um you know generate the data as a scientist and um we we, we really need to understand better what makes what drives people to do this extra work to really share the data. And I think we've come a long way and elements such as the Global Ocean Science Report of uh, IUC UNESCO has really explained and showed with data 
how if you share your data, if you publish your data, this leads to um, increased collaboration at the international level. And internationalization um, um, leverages the um, quality of your data, the excellence of your data. It actually leads you to create new opportunities for your data. So as we understand this better, we convince people to become part of this of, of this. Um, of, of this uh, sharing data and um, promoting uh, data sharing. Another element that I did not hear about today is about semantics. We did speak about semantics, but not about the multilingual aspects of it. So I understand that um, the standards for marine data up to now um, is still largely based on English semantics. And I think we need to step up uh, multilingual aspects to make sure that um, our data the data out there become really, truly more uh, findable and accessible and so that we really can ensure that we connect all the data in this large knowledge graph. Um, so to conclude, because I took much more note, but Kate already invited us to share our, our, uh, our, our notes and our take-home take messages, so I, I will definitely get them over to you, <laughs> Kate. But something that really struck me this week is that we are all talking about uh, sustainability this week, right? So, And our focus is, is on SDG 14. But really what struck me uh, over the, the three days that we, we have already been together is that the SDG 17 aspect of it is really um, underestimated. And I heard a lot of times that um, long-term commitments, engagements, even a lot of voluntary work that is going into these large processes um, is, is, is really driven by projects and um, initiatives that take two or three years. So that, this really hampers us in our technical developments because we're not able to think and plan ahead and this really um, somehow also um, limits our, our capacity our, our ability not capacity to build services for the user so I think the way to approach this is to be more strategic and we're too fragmented we have to be more strategic and think and work more as one and I talked to uh, well Pierre Luigi talked to me not me to him but we spoke we spoke about this and I think we really can do um, we really need to step up our ambition there to, to think uh, uh, more as one and to come out with one stronger voice. I will not speak about everything that's related to quality assessment. My colleague uh, at the Vlis Data Center said to me last week, I prefer no data uh, than bad data. And there was somebody else that spoke uh, you know, in another direction, there's of course different levels of, of quality, um, but that's something we really need to look at. And some of the data are really crucial, even in a small data set, we can find and explore huge and come to new insights. Sometimes these data are historical and it really takes uh, manual work, you know, uh, uh, the, like we have slow food, this is slow data processing and we need to also take care of that because we spoke a lot about data that are you know 20 years old but there's also all the data out there that are really um, hard but we need to get them into the process so I'll finish just by saying that um, what I would really like because we were asked some of you were asked not me to speak about our dreams and I think that um, it's really lovely. It's great to see this um, UN Ocean Decade Data Coordination Group come together and I really would invite you and us and them to um, to, to also fulfill this uh, function of a think tank, a think tank uh, incorporating like futurologists, uh, people that understand where this world is going to and understand better like uh, I think Telmo said, um, I'm more on the working on the policy side and I see this need that Telmo speak about, spoke about. We, we're moving towards um, real uh, uh, or near real-time uh, data generation and this creates expectations from the policy side. We're speaking about um, dynamic ocean management as you said we see where the resources are going so we want to ensure that all the other data that that we need to take the right decisions are there also at near real-time or real-time so that is 
a huge challenge and I, I really hear you there, Telmo. And um, so I would really like to see data philosophers and data futurologists and people that look at human behavior to see how we can uh, bring this all together. And then I would like to end with um, something uh, that was also uh, said quite a lot, and that is I would like to also commend uh, um, Flanders government uh, on this. Um, since uh, Flanders government has been also lo largely investing not only in the Ocean Info Hub, but also in the Ocean Teacher Global Academy, and that's the capacity development aspect we should not underestimate. Um, and um, especially, um, as was said, this all should be driven by the demand, by the users. Otherwise, there is no future for that. So I would like to end on that note. Um, and. Kate, I promise that there's a few pages here that will be coming up. Thank you. Thank you very much, anne Katrine. I'd ask the other members of the data coordination group to raise your hand if you are here. Uh, as you've heard, uh, we are, uh, Jan Bart, raise your hand, you're the co-chair. Uh, uh, we are working on this strategy to lift up what we are hearing today, to capture these hopes and dreams, and to capitalize and advance this work to create the systems to support the data we need to create the ocean we want. Please reach out to one of us, share with us your ideas and your inspirations. We will do our best to help chart that path forward for the decade. Thank you all for your time, for the work that you are doing to support the decade and to support ocean data. And please enjoy your evening.